Good morning, and welcome to Ask Me Anything, Power, Tool, Safety. My name is Shirley Paulson, and I'm your moderator today. Thank you for joining us. To adjust your audio settings, please, please click on the microphone at the bottom left of your screen, then click the up arrow to select audio controls. Although your microphone is muted, you can ask questions at any time using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. You can also use the chat section to share your thoughts and let us know where you're from. I'm honored to be joining you from the Fraser Valley Office of the Manufacturing Safety Alliance of BC, located in Chilliwack and residing on the traditional and unceded territories of the Stolo Coast Salish people. Our Kelowna office, where today's speaker is based, is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Silix Okanagan people. We are grateful for the opportunity to speak to you and share in our discussions on a very important topic from these shared lands today. The Manufacturing Safety Alliance is the nonprofit and safety association for manufacturers and food processors in BC. Our team of experts is here to help you navigate health and safety regulations or achieve core certification, the Occupational Safety Standard of Excellence, or OC, for manufacturing. Call on us anytime for health and safety training information, tools, or advice. Before we start today's AMA session, I'd like to note that today is International Women's Day. And point out that many of the early demonstrations for International Women's Day were for better and safer working conditions, designing effective health and safety tools and PPE for women in manufacturing and food processing means more than just pinking it and shrinking it. Today's Women in Safety Summit is just one of several upcoming events tackling this topic. Tomorrow, Alliance CEO and founder Lisa McGuire is joining other women safety leaders in a fireside chat at the Women in Safety Summit to talk about skills development for women safety professionals. You can learn more about that in the link that's posted in the chat. Coming back to today's topic, we're looking forward to an opportunity to learn more about how to keep ourselves and others safe using power tools. Today's Ask Me Anything session on power tool safety will be held be led by Lauren Davies, CRSP, one of our specialist safety advisors here at the Alliance. While Lauren's particular specialty is combustible dust, he has decades of experience and expertise on the safe use of power tools, including response, responding to injuries. He has seen people get hurt and he wants to help you stay safe. Thanks for joining us, Lauren. Before Lauren begins, I'd like to remind everyone that you may ask questions in the Q&A icon at any time during the session. We'll address as many as we can by the end of the hour. Lauren, welcome. Please get us started. Thanks, Shirley. I'm happy to see that you guys are all here today. Let's try to see if I can get my video started here. <laughs> just waiting for Lauren to start his camera in just a moment. Here yes. we go. Has everyone got my camera okay? We're great. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank everyone to our session on power tool safety today. 
Uh, power tools have continued to evolve and they become more effective and versatile over the years than ever before. As users, we can make the work we do faster, more efficient, and a lot better job. However, improper use of these tools can put us at a higher risk. Today, I'd like to share some information to reinforce using the right tool with the right accessories to do the required task. Using the right tool, following the right procedures will allow us to do our job safely and get satisfaction from having the job well done. So let's get started. So before we get too carried away, I'd just like to do a little disclaimer here saying the session is only for awareness and discussion purposes. This session will not qualify you to operate powered hand tools or any other type of power tools. And participants are encouraged to take specific power tool training that meets the occupational health and safety regulation requirements and other requirements uh, before you start. Now, one other little thing I'd like to bring to your attention is the internal responsibility system is the underlying philosophy of the occupational health and safety legislation in Canada. Its foundation is that everyone in the workplace, both employees and employers, is responsible for his or her own safety and for the safety of coworkers. Now, the reason that I'm bringing this to your attention is, is it's just a reminder that if you see someone operating a hand tool incorrectly, that you should intervene to get them proper training. We have, a, we have a real temptation to laugh at a coworker attempting to drill a hole while the drill is operating in reverse, but that creates a culture where people are afraid to ask for, for help. Demonstrate some leadership and take, make a difference by helping that person get the training to do it right. Another little housekeeping slide is that every employer must ensure that regular inspections are made of all workplaces, including buildings, structures, grounds, excavations, tools, equipment, machinery, and work methods and practices at intervals that will prevent the development of unsafe working conditions. This is just a reminder. It's the employer's responsibility to have a safe workplace. But in order for that to actually work, they depend on the workers to make them aware of developing hazards so they can correct it. If you have a power tool that's damaged, follow your company's defective tool policy to have it replaced or repaired. Don't use power hand tools that have defective guards or for instance, broken cords. Just so that you're aware that this actually is an issue, here's a power hand tool claim graph. And this graph basically illustrates the claims using hand tools from 2017 to 2021. You might be thinking that the number for drill claims looks really high, but the way that these are, are, are sort of collected is that if you are falling off a ladder while drilling a hole, this would be recorded as an injury related to power hand tool use for drilling. That's why that number looks so high. Now, the next thing we'd like to sort of touch on is the, the hazards of power tools. And one of the things that we're really caught aware, unaware of by a lot of people is the force generated by power tools is quite substantial. And for new people using tools, it is often underestimated. And as a result, if the cutting bit jams, it tends to throw them off balance. And from there, only bad things happen. Power tools are designed to quickly machine materials much stronger than human flesh. So if a cutting bit touches you, it's not going to slow down at all. So we really need to make sure that that doesn't happen. Improper operations can lead to loss of control of a power tool. And once the power tool is moving on its own, you don't know where it's going to land. And as a result, these can result in life-changing injuries. This last one is designed for all of you in the audience that have it all figured out. You might have had years of experience. And I can tell you from my experience that I've personally been aware of, of people that have died from power saw injuries or chainsaws, one at work and one while just cutting firewood. I know of several tradesmen that have had amputations. These people are not rookies. These people are, are, have years and even possibly decades of experience. You need to make sure that you do not lose focus on your task because the moment you do, you're putting yourself at risk for an injury. So if you cannot make, maintain your focus on a task, you really need to wonder whether you should be continuing. In order to operate your hand tool safely, you need to plan your task and remove the hazards before you start. 
ask yourself the question, if someone was going to get hurt here, how would it happen? Having a clear work area free of hazards will allow you to focus on your task at hand, not on how to balance on a pile of scraps when you're cutting. The same applies if you're working on a ladder. Can you maintain your three-point contact while working? Maybe you need a platform ladder or possibly even just a scaffold to work safely. Think about this before you do the task, not after you're falling. Now, one of the things that we all need to be aware of is that wearing the right PPE. First question I'll ask you to think about is, what do you think is missing from this picture? If you're grinding, for instance, you should actually have a leather apron on. This will prevent things like shattered disc pieces from sticking into your skin, which can be uh, quite painful and usually a pain in the butt to have removed. The gloves in this picture are cut protective class four for handling the metal in the picture. Remember, normally we don't use gloves for handling power tools, hand power tools, but if you're holding something like a piece of metal, you'd like to have something to protect your hand so that if it jars or moves, it's not slicing your fingers. PP is your last line of defense. It needs to fit properly to do its job. If you're using gloves that are, are the right size, you need less grip force, which makes it easier for you. If you're using gloves that are oversized, it means that you have to grip the object more tightly, which defeats the purpose. Remember that any oversized PPE increases the entanglement risk. So wearing a vis vest that can double as a Superman cape is not the best idea. We have PPE that has evolved to a high level now. So you can get PPE in any size for any form and multiple different types of cut hazard resistances, et cetera. So don't use PPE that's not right for your job. If, you, if your PPE doesn't fit well, ask your supervisor. There's lots of suppliers that can provide you with exactly what you need. This next slide is just some drills. Drills seem like they're really harmless. Unfortunately, they contribute to a lot of injuries. In our graph, we had 1,398 injuries over that four year period as a result of drilling. Now, some of those injuries are from people pushing a drill through an object that they're drilling and actually catching themselves whether it's a leg or whether it's actually a hand. Other people are using a drill to drill a hole and losing their balance. And as a result, they're falling from a ladder or from uh, another object. Remember when you're working on a ladder to use your three-point contact to ensure that if you have a bit of a jolt or a jar from something catching that you're maintaining your balance. Remember, if you're standing on a pail or other improvised device that you don't have any chance if you have an issue. So make sure you don't use those. They're not designed for, for working at elevation. All drills have the ability to jam while they're in operation. When it jams, the force that the tool uses will, will instead transfer to the user and the drill will attempt to spin out of your hands or cause the object being drilled to spin, possibly causing injury, especially if it's a sharp piece of metal like I had in the previous picture. A drill bit can easily drill through the material it's meant to drill through and into the objects behind it, such as a hand holding two parts together. So again, be aware of those things. Routers. Routers are a lot of fun. They're actually the go-to tool for a lot of manufacturing processes because of the diversity of applications. And this is continuing to grow. One of the concerns about routers though, is they have extremely high speed and they have carbide cutters usually that make serious damage to human tissue if they come together. So we really need to make sure that we're managing our use of routers properly. Because routers turn at about 20,000 RPM or more, they can throw chips or other debris a long distance. So always wear your safety glasses. Remember that there's lots of things that are unexpected in the workplace. And it could be something as simple as a screw that's not supposed to be there. And if you catch it with a router, it's going to throw that screw uh, possibly into your face if you're not positioned properly. So be aware of that. Remember that large bits, and I'm referring to ones that are you know, over an inch in diameter, for instance, are designed to be used where the router is mounted in a table or in a jig. Holding the router by hand can lead to loss of control if you have too much cutting going on as far as the depth of cut goes. 
So be aware of that. Some of the bigger routers that we're using uh, basically are creating three, three and a half horsepower. They have the ability to take you for a serious ride if you hit something solid. So again, be aware of that. Bearing guided bits help to reduce the possible depth of cut, but you have to be careful setting them to make sure that you don't take too much material off at once. Okay. In order to produce a product that does not require additional uh, finishing or sanding, it's recommended to use multiple shallow cuts to work towards the final product. Uh, taking large single passes will increase the tear out on the surface and it actually is gonna increase the possibility of loss of control. You need to secure the piece being machined so that you can focus on the task at hand. Sometimes if you're, using a, if you're machining a small piece, using a non-slip mat on your workbench will help it from sliding around while you're working with smaller objects that have to be handheld. The next picture here, we just got a few saws that are pretty standard in, in an industry. The newer saws, a lot of these now will be cordless. Either way, they both cut extremely well. One of the key areas of dealing with saws is understanding the proper blades that you need to be wearing, using while you're using the saws. Remember that powered hand saws should cut at a consistent rate. If the tool slows down, do not increase the load or add additional force. Ease up and allow that tool to return to its normal speed. Be aware of your body position. Set it up so that you can cut along the desired direction of the line without having to reposition yourself while cutting or push the tool sideways to get to your uh, appropriate line. Nail guns, one of my favorites. Again, we have over a thousand injuries with this in this study. Nail guns are a lot of fun to use because they are so fast and they are, uh, you don't have to worry about banging your fingers and all those other good things. Things to watch for are that the nails you're using to fasten something to another does not protrude the other side. This is just a recipe for disaster because usually it's your hand holding the pieces together. Understand if the nail can be redirected if you hit something solid. So this happens quite frequently when you hit a knot or possibly a screw or a piece of hardware that's fastened. The bigger the nail gun, the bigger the projectile is becoming directly back towards you or possibly towards the person that's holding the block that you're shooting. So again, be aware of that. Make sure that you wear your protective equipment and take a look at the material you're fastening and ensure that there isn't other debris in the way. Don't forget to wear your safety glasses. The reason is I don't know what day you'll have this problem. And if you wear your safety glasses, when it does happen, you won't lose your eyes as a result. This next picture, actually, uh, we discussed the actual cutters and blades that we're using. The top of the picture, you can see these are uh, sawzall blades and you can see there's a wide variety from metal to wood cutting varieties. There's some sample uh, router bits there. What I'd like to actually concentrate here is the saw blades that we see in the middle of the picture. You can see the picture on the left, it has a 10 inch blade. It's a uh, 80 tooth blade. This type of blade is designed for cross cutting across materials like laminate or uh, flooring or even lumber, cross cutting it across the two by four, for instance, width of a, of a, of a piece of lumber. The one in the middle of the picture is actually a rip blade. It's designed for cutting along the length of a piece of lumber. You'll notice that the teeth are quite a bit larger and there's space between the teeth to actually store the wood sawdust that's being generated as a result of the cut. If you don't have this type of blade when you're ripping, if you use the previous blade for ripping, those small teeth would fill up those gaps between the teeth with sawdust. And as a result, the cut is going to slow down and start to generate heat. When this happens, then you're gonna have a couple of issues happen. You're either gonna kick the breaker on your electrical circuit, or the next thing is, is the saw is gonna kick back towards you because it's gonna jam. This situation happens with all cutting tools. So you really need to make sure that you're paying attention to what blade do I have for the operation that I'm doing. This is one of the leading causes of injuries is not using the proper blades in the tools that you've got. 
Now, one step lower, you can see that we've got some grinding wheels. The one on the left is actually a grinding wheel designed for grinding steel. The one in the middle is actually designed for cutting steel. And the one on the right is actually for cutting aluminum. And we're going to get to that in a minute. So remember, before we get there, that if a powered saw is not cutting effectively, it's often either because the blade is dull or the wrong blade is being used for the task. A blade or cutting bit that cannot clear the material waste from the cutting operation will slow down, overheat, activate the circuit breaker, or kick the workpiece or the saw back towards the operator. You need to understand that wood cells run longitudinally. So when you're cross-cutting a piece of lumber, the sawdust particles, when you're cross-cutting a piece of lumber, the particles are small. But when you're ripping a piece of lumber, the particles are larger. So the saw blade, saw blade needs more space to store them. So until they get ejected when the saw blade clears the lumber. If this doesn't happen, this is a common, uh, very common situation for people to have issues. Next up is our common hand grinder. Almost everyone has one because they're so versatile and handy. Unfortunately, it's one of the highest causing injury tools that we have on our list today. A couple things to watch for is the guard on hand grinders protects the user from flying debris when and if the wheel shatters. It's also important to have in place because it prevents you from installing the wrong size wheel. So keep it on. Hand grinders wheels break for several reasons. One, horizontal pressure being used during a vertical cut. It's not designed to have horizontal pressure in a vertical mode. Vertical pressure on a horizontal grind. Improper wheel for material being uh, used or surfaced. Improper wheel for the grinder RPM. These are all things that cause these wheels to fail. And you notice that I actually said when the wheel shatters, not if. Almost anyone that's worked with a hand grinder has seen a wheel let go. It's not something that happens um, only now and then, it happens quite frequently. So we need to be prepared for that. But here's a little example of what I'm referring to. This is an RPM rating on a four and a half inch grinder. It tells you that it can turn at 10,000 RPM which is pretty fast. We need to make sure that we're aware of what our grinder is turning for RPM. So before using a hand grinder, you should always confirm that the RPM rating for the wheel exceeds the labeled RPM for the grinder. So don't put a 4,800 RPM wheel on a 10,000 RPM grinder. That's one of the reasons the guard is in place. It won't allow you to do that. Before installing a wheel on a grinder, do a, a ring test on a wheel before installing it to ensure it's not defective. If you uh, do a ring test, it's a very simple test to do. You basically uh, support the wheel and strike it with a non-metallic object at about 45 degrees from the support point. It will ring kind of like a bell and give you a clear tone. If the, ob if the um, wheel is defective it or has a crack in it, it will deaden that sound. And it's quite obvious if you're listening to it that the tone is not clear anymore. This is an easy test to ensure that the wheel is in good condition before you put it in place. Remember that as wheels increase in size, the rated RPM speed decreases. So if you put a larger wheel on a grinder that is not intended for, it's going to be turning at almost twice its rated RPM, which makes it more susceptible to breaking. Give an example here. This is an RPM rating of a four and a half inch disc. The maximum RPM on this disc is 13,300. For a six inch disc, for instance, the RPM rated would be probably around the 4,800 neighborhood. If you notice, this is also a disc that's designed for aluminum. The reason we have aluminum discs is because if you use a steel disc to cut aluminum, you're going to generate a lot of problems. The aluminum is quite a bit softer than steel, so it'll fill the pores in the aluminum wheel. And when you realize it's not cutting very well, most operators push down harder, which causes the wheel to shatter. That's 
one of the reasons why we really need to be careful about grinders and using the proper tools and the proper accessories on these tools. Again, when people realize that the tool is not working the way they want, the first response is usually to push harder. And that's not the best response. It's usually to stop and say, why is this not working well? Next is line of fire. Line of fire is a term that refers to when workers place themselves in harm's way. Be aware of your position relative to the cutting tool. If it cuts faster than anticipated, will it contact your hand? If the blade breaks, will the tools, will the tools actually strike you? If the tool kicks back, will it, you be in the line of fire and get struck? If it contacts a nail, will it throw pieces of it into your face or eyes? This sounds very simple and common sense, but this happens a lot in our injuries with power tools. Next, I'd like you to follow the manufacturer's instruction. Basically, what they tell you is to use the right tool for the right job. Follow manufacturer's instructions for the installation of approved accessories, inspection, testing, repair, and maintenance of any tool. Keep the manufacturer's instructions handy for workers to access. Remember that if you're building uh, procedures to consult them, they will give you specific instructions and safe work procedures for job specific situations and materials. So don't ignore them, they're there for a reason. So one of the reasons we're doing this little webinar today is to cause you to think about some of these things and actually take some action. Remember that training is not something that is, is given everywhere. So don't assume that your people are properly trained just because they've worked somewhere else that does something similar to you. They need to understand the importance and how to inspect the tool before use to ensure that they don't start a tool that's damaged. It's very easy to take a hand grinder and drop it on the floor and then put it back on the workbench for the next guy. Follow the manufacturer's instructions. If the manufacturer says, use a four and a half inch wheel, use a four and a half inch wheel. Remember to stay out of the line of fire or body position when you're cutting. Part of this is to ensure that you've actually got a good stance so that if something does jam a little bit, it doesn't throw you off balance. Wear the suggested PPE, it's there to protect you. Remember that you don't need PPE every day, only on the days when something goes wrong. Lastly is body position. And this is not the same body position that I referred to earlier. This is making sure that you set up your workstation so that if you have to cut 500 pieces, that you do it on a workbench, not sitting on the ground on a block. As a result of that, you'll be looking at putting muscle groups at risk. Remember that when you're, when you're uncomfortable, your mind is not on your task, and that's putting you at further at risk. Lastly on my list is the right to refuse unsafe work. And this is just a reminder slide that if you don't know how to use a proper power tool or you're not familiar with it, ask your supervisor for training. As much as we'd like to, don't wing it. Even though we, it's uncomfortable for us to ask sometimes, don't do this. It only takes a second to ask someone for some help and get the proper instructions. Remember that being injured is not good for anyone. And I, I have a little something to share with the supervisors that might be with us today. As managers and supervisors, understand that you may have had power tool training in shop class in high school. Shop class is being discontinued from a lot of high schools as a result of budget cuts. Graduates can now leave high school never having experienced a power tool. Don't depend on common sense to keep your people safe. Assume no knowledge or experience until proven otherwise. Here's a few additional resources that we have to offer. We have toolbox talks on angle grinders and bench grinders and drill presses, et cetera, on our site that you can access for free. We have hazard identification training and online virtual instructor-led sessions. And if you have any questions around PPE, don't be afraid to reach out to a safety advisor for specific concerns and suppliers. So these are things that are easily um, achievable for you. Just reach out and ask. 
there's my contact information in case you have any questions for me. I hope you enjoyed this little session today and thank you for attending. Uh, please reach out to the Alliance if you require more information on this or any other safety topic. Now we can move on to our questions that you may have. Thank you so much for that, Lauren. Um, it was fantastic to be able to tap into your expertise. And now is where we would like to invite the questions um, that have come in from the audience through the Q&A. And we are going to, um, we're going to start with that in just a moment here. Thank you for um, coming back, staying on the screen so that we can get to the present, uh, to the questions. So our very first question is um, coming from our audience. It's great. It's a great question. What depth should a circular saw be set at? This is a good question because a lot of people like to pick up a saw and use it without readjusting the saw blade. Understand that because uh, we just need to clear the cut of the wood that we're cutting. So normally that's between an eighth and a quarter of an inch protruding through the, the thickness of the material we're cutting. Remember that by doing this, if we do have a kickback situation, that we're greatly reducing the amount of injury that we could be exposed to if that saw strikes us. So again, the guard might come down a portion. If the saw is properly set, it means a lot less damage to us as people than if we have the blade set at full depth. Yeah. Thank you. That's really great information. Um, great question. Um, our next question is when using routers, why is the depth of the cut such a concern? Well, routers turn so extremely fast, it, it's hard for us to actually picture 20,000 or 24,000 RPM. The bit is really spinning quickly. And if we set the depth so we're cutting a 16th of an inch, the rotor is very easy for us to control. But if the rotor set depth is set for an inch, for instance, if we hit something that's higher in density, such as a knot, there's a lot of torque being applied when that bit turning at 20,000 RPM strikes something solid. And are you prepared to hang on to that rotor? If you're not, it can fly right out of your hands. So we really want to make sure that we are careful about the depth of cut. So as a result, if we take several cuts that are less deep, we will remove less material per pass and we have better control. And the final product is actually quite nice. It's a lot smoother and requires less sanding and, and cleaning up to make sure that that meets your specifications. So again, uh, take your time, do it right, and there's no fuss. That's wonderful. It, it also goes along with the measure twice, cut once. <laughs> also is part of it. But the safety piece of that is really important for our audience today and for everyone who's using power tools. Uh, is there anything that you would like to add that should be part of a safety checklist for the operation and maintenance of a power tool? Well, the key part is actually following the manufacturer's instructions so that you can actually ensure what they, for their particular tool, would like you to check. For instance, that could be that uh, when you're tightening a bit, that that bit is actually tight before you actually put it into operation. It could be that the teeth on the saw blade are facing in the right direction, because if they're not, it's going to take you for a ride. So there's a lot of things that the manufacturer brings forward in their instructions for you to take a look at, and everything from a ring test to ensuring that the proper um, RPM for your blades or for your grinding discs are proper for the tool. Remember that your saw blades also have an RPM rating on them, and you need to make sure that the right RPM for the saw blade is for the tool that you're actually using. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have another question here about um, what your opinion is on using angle grider, grinders without the side handle. So the side handle, this gives you a little bit better control because now you can have a better stance and you can control where you're grinding uh, quite a bit better. So obviously there are some situations where you need to remove the handle to get into a tight corner, but you're going to need to be extra careful in there because again, when you're cutting or grinding in a tight corner, there's a possibility that if the tool bucks a little bit, that you'll be striking another surface, which is going to cause it to buck in another direction. Right. So it's very, you have to be very careful in those tight corners with an angle grinder to make sure that you're maintaining control. 
So the handle comes in quite handy for providing that extra control. But saying that, there is some situations where you might need to remove that handle, but you're gonna to have to grip the tool by its body instead to maintain a, uh, a good grip. And you're gonna to have to make sure your body position is in good, so you have a good stance, so that if something does buck a little bit, that you can still maintain control of that tool. Okay, again, uh, again, you know, paying attention to those those details about what you're doing and where you're where you're headed with your activity. So um, do you have, uh, this is another question, do you have any recommendations on make and model of low pri profile half face piece respirators to be used when welding, i.e. something that interfaces well with a welding hamlet? Okay, well, this is actually, a, I do have a good couple uh, good suggestions on this. One is respirators are always a bit of a pain in the butt while you're welding um, because you obviously you're trying to squeeze that under your, your welding shield. One of the best situations you can do is actually, instead of using a regular respirator, is to use a PAPR, which is a powered respirator. As a result, your respirator is actually on your back instead of underneath your welding helmet, and it okay. blows cool air, filtered air, over your face piece welding helmet. It doesn't require you to actually be clean shaven because it's a positive pressure system. And as a result, you could wear a beard underneath your, face, underneath your welding helmet if you wanted and still have nothing but clean air coming into your face piece. So if you are actually a professional welder, I would really consider talking to your boss about seeing if you can get this type of personal protective equipment because it gives you good, comfortable service over the time that you're welding. If you're a professional welder, you spend a lot of time under your helmet. Now saying that, if you can't get the PAPR, there is special uh, 3M uh, made devices that are low profile that I'm aware of that seem to give good service. There is also the on the back type um, respirator that again, what you wear as a backpack as opposed to as a face piece and you draw in a breathing tube versus having your face in a respirator. So there is a couple different styles to investigate and see which one works well, both for a cost and for a comfort perspective for you. Hope that was Lord, helpful. I, I, I find that very helpful. I find it very interesting. I'm learning a lot today. So th thank you. And of course, that's the purpose of Ask Me Anything. Um, so uh, another question that has just come in is what air pressure should nail guns be set at? Well, this is very, this is another good question, actually, because you need to make sure that your nail guns are actually sinking the nails below, just to the below the surface, not any deeper. If you have your air pressure turned up too high, um, then you're actually going to be sinking the nails and they're actually going to be passing through the outside of the surface on the opposite side, which is going to leave a cut hazard for anyone handling the objects that you're building. So what we'd like to do is have either a regulator on your air compressor so you can set it, or the other option is for uh, a small fee, actually pretty, uh, pretty cheap, I think they're less than $20. You can put a regulator right on the end of the air hose prior to the tool, and you can just dial it up and dial it down so it gives you the appropriate pressure for whatever products you're working in, and you don't actually have to walk back to the compressor to reset it. So that's, that's what I would recommend there. Okay, that's great. Uh, so, uh another another question there's quite a few questions today you mentioned a ring test earlier in your presentation can can you give us a demonstration well i, I can show you but i'm not sure if you'll be able to hear it properly okay. i happen to have a little grinding disc here let's see if i move it around yeah, i can see it and you can just put it on a support device and this is just a paintbrush handle and if you look at it from a see if I can do this. If you look vertically where you're supporting it and come over about 45 degrees with a non-metallic object, you can just give it a tap. I'm not sure if you hear that properly, but it gives you a clear tone. And once you have that clear tone, you know there's no cracks in the wheel. If it doesn't give you that clear tone, uh, you'll actually, it'll be a dead tone. And as a result, you know there's a crack in the wheel because it's not allowing the transmission of the vibrations. So it's just an easy test that you can do in less than a minute to ensure your wheels are in good condition before you install them. That's really great advice. That's, that tone is really, really important. Uh, it's just one of those, it's a 
it's um, auditory rather than visual. So yes. uh, yeah. you won't see a crack because they're usually so fine. So that demonstration might not have been um, a lot for you, but if you Google ring test on Google, you'll see a, a better demonstration for you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, so uh, the audience, we have a, a few more a few more minutes for questions. The audience can keep sending them in. Um, but uh, another one here is um, our attendee would like is asking, how can I reduce the amount of tear out left over from the cutting the plywood with a circular saw? Well, just remember that a circular saw cuts from the bottom up. So the first thing is, is that you'd like to make sure that the good surface of your plywood is facing down, not facing you as you're cutting. Okay. Secondly, you'd like to make sure that if you're cutting a piece that you really require a nice finish on, what you can do is you can score the line with, a, with like an exact knife before so that the veneer breaks cleanly. Another little trick to use is actually if you mask uh, the cutting line with some masking tape, and that will help hold the veneer in place as well. So those are just a few little uh, little tricks that you can do. The last one is you can actually do a, you can just cut through the veneer with one pass and then cut, lower your cut and cut it again, and that will stop a lot of the uh, tear out as well. But again, depending on how um, tricky the finishing that you're trying to do for that particular piece of plywood, but really the, the number one thing is make sure you've got the right blade for the job that you're doing. So if you're just cutting plywood, use a blade with a lot of teeth in it, and it won't be taking so much out per revolution. So each cut will be a little bit smaller with the every tooth. So using a plywood blade, um, for instance, might have 100 teeth in it, as opposed to a rip blade that might have 40. So it'll give you a lot smoother, nicer finishing cut. Okay. That's more great advice. You're just a fount of knowledge on this. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, so in your experience, then, what has been one of the more surprising inquiries that could have been prevented if all hazards had been considered? That's kind of a tricky question. The, the mm -hmm. key part of this is taking a look at your task that you're doing and looking to see where are the issues before you get started. Uh, many times people are cutting a bunch of blocks and they're standing on the top of the blocks cutting more blocks. And then when some of the blocks slip right away and they're in the middle of a cut. So as a result, you know, you're cutting the cord, you're cutting fingers, you're cutting all sorts of things as you're trying to catch your balance. So if I had one thing to, um, to convey to the people today in our, our, in our session is take a look first before you start. Make sure that you set yourself up with a good body position. If you have to cut a bunch of material, put it on a, on a set of sawhorses or put it on a, on a workbench so that you can cut it and maintain your balance properly. When you don't have to worry about your balance, you can concentrate on what you're doing with the cutting or the routing or whatever you're doing instead of wondering about that stuff. Make sure that you have your cords untangled so that they're not tripping you. These are all what we would call common sense stuff. But unfortunately, common sense is not that common. So we need to actually work with our employees to step them through these processes and say, hey, you know, it only takes a second for you to clean up this debris uh, underneath where you're working. Stepping on it could lead you to have a slip or an issue if you right. lose your balance or contribute to your losing your balance. So these are all minor things. But if a router, if you drop a router onto your leg, it's going to do a lot of damage. It's turning at 20,000 RPM. And even if you unplug it, as we're, even if it gets unplugged as a result of flying off the workpiece, it's still coasting down from 20,000 RPM with a carbide cutter that will do significant damage to your leg or to your arm. So understand that these tools are designed to cut objects that are a lot harder than your human skin and flesh. So if you let, allow them to contact your skin and flesh, it's gonna hurt. We really need to make sure that we respect these tools. They do a great job for us and they can be a lot of fun to use and give us great satisfaction. But if we don't respect the tools for what they can do to us, not paying attention can lead us into a situation where we can get seriously hurt. 
This is all great advice, not just for the workplace where, where our goal is to have workers go home safe at the end of the day, but it also plays a role, of course, in the household and work that we might be doing as a hobby. So this is really great ad advice for those who are doing some personal endeavor endeavors with power tools. So that, that's fantastic. Um, I'm gonna have one more question and then um, a couple comments and then um, we'll move into my last few words. So uh, with regard to the PPE for operating nail guns, has anyone tested trying to shoot a nail through the lens of various ratings of safety glasses, i.e. ANSI Z87, ANSI Z87+, plus, et cetera, did the nail deflect, partially penetrate the lens, or fully penetrate the lens? And distance being point blank ranges and regulators set at a standard level of pressure. Long question to say, what is the testing that's been done on which type of uh, safety glasses? Well, obviously, uh, the person is familiar with the uh, ANSI standards, and there is several uh, standards that are available depending on which operation you're dealing with and you can specify which standard you'd like for your safety glasses. Understand that most of the time, uh, people are not using a nail gun directly up against your face, you know, shooting uh, nails into your face. Mm -hmm. Normally what the situation is, is that you are attaching a product together and the nail strikes a solid object or a high density object, such as a piece of mounting hardware. It deflects off of that uh, mounting hardware losing some of its steam or some of its energy and back into your face. Now, without any safety glasses on, that's gonna penetrate a very soft eye very easily. With a properly rated uh, pair of ANSI safety glasses on, uh, the nail will not normally penetrate. There is situations where it will partially penetrate. Right. But either way, that's way better than having nothing in front of you. So if you're using a particular type of high um, energy nailing type gun that you're concerned about, consult the ANSI standards for the highest standard to give you protection. If you're just using normal uh, pressure ratings for your uh, guns for finishing nailers, et cetera, the normal ANSI standard will cover, will basically cover you for the application. Okay, thank you. And, and that's all the time that we have for questions today. We're going to have to stop here. Um, I do want to ask if you have any um, final thoughts for this presentation. Well, if I had one final thought, I guess it was, if you don't know, ask. It's easy, and you might find some interesting things when you actually ask someone about how should I do this. Yeah. And if the person that you ask doesn't know, then consult your um, manufacturer's um, manual to see if you can figure it out but there's lots of people to ask if you don't know and so just take a few minutes and do that now if you don't ask you can be seriously hurt and it's going to take a long time to heal and possibly never so have yourself a great day thank you for attending today and thank you, Lauren, for presenting today. This was a great opportunity for folks to learn about um, additional safety elements of the power tools that are used and used all the time by people in the manufacturing food processing industry. So really appreciate that. Uh, so uh, thank you again and helping us understand power tool safety. And to everyone in our audience, thank you for joining us today and sharing your questions. If we didn't get to yours, We'll do our best to get answers for you and share them in the follow-up on the website. I'm uh, Just give me one moment here. So if you are joining us today from the Okanagan, from the interior, don't miss the chance to attend the new Make It Safe live Okanagan conference on April 21st in Kelowna, BC. Early bird savings on your Make It Safe tickets ends on March 15th. Register today at makeitsafe.ca. Again, that's makeitsafe.ca to save your seats. And of course, if uh, mark your calendar for the 2023 Safety Pinnacle Awards Gala.
on June 8th in Surrey. For those who attended last year, it's in the same location. Uh, check out the website and we hope you can all join us that evening to celebrate the industry's health and safety successes. Very exciting evening. Uh, so visit us online at any time for training or assistance and to access our library of webinars and resources. Watch for an email tomorrow with a link to the recording of today's session and a survey link to share your feedback. And again, thank you for attending and take good care.